Hi, I'm David J. Knight, Director of Exhibitions and Collections at Northern Kentucky University School of the Arts. Today you'll be watching three of our nine Spring BFA Visual Arts graduates give talk about the artwork in their BFA senior exhibits. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many things to be done in new ways. Normally, these nine BFA seniors would have an on-location scenery exhibition in the NKU Art Galleries and give their talks in the galleries with lots of family, friends, and supporters. Since this is not possible this semester, their exhibitions will be held virtually. A video of all their artwork will follow at a later date. The seniors have worked very hard this semester with all the quick changes to adapt to a new way for all to experience their artwork. For some, it was not easy as others to do. I commend them for doing the best that they could do with the challenges put forth to them. Please enjoy their talks as they tell a bit more about their artwork and what it is all about. Thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Gina Iverdi and my BFA focus is in painting. I first took a public art class at NKU in my fall semester of 2018, while I was also working as a public art apprentice. The course at NKU was designed to give us a true experience of the proposal process with an opportunity for realization of our projects in Newport, Kentucky. The prompt was to install our work on the wall that was facing the Newport History Museum, which was formerly known as the Southgate Street School. We did research, we participated in community involvement, wrote up contracts, budgets, timelines, letters of intent, and we made our own scale mock-ups of the projects. We were eventually juried by a group of um, Newport citizens and a few of our projects were chosen for continuation. Through the last few semesters of my undergraduate studies, my project has evolved into something much larger in scope than I would have ever expected. And I had to adapt my project and write several proposals to overcome each obstacle that came my way. So I wanted to share a few of my designs and how it's evolved over time. The original prototypes were ceramic tiles designed for a single six foot by nine foot space. I went on to make the second prototype as I had the possibility of actually installing on site. I refined some elements and added the teacher who is critical to the composition and the concept. The final result of my proposal will be a series of 19 murals along the Newport flood wall on Dave Cohen's drive by the I-275 or 71 ramps. It was evident that ceramic tile wouldn't work on the new site, so I had to adjust the piece to fit the new medium, acrylic paint and the size of the mural, which is about 36 feet long by 16 feet tall. To the left of the design, a teacher assists a student at a chalkboard. Waves of color flow through them, leading into a portrait of a college graduate on the right. This piece is inspired by Virenda Dotti, who attended the Southgate Street School during segregation. She provided me with some photographs from her childhood and her college years. The Southgate Street School building still stands today, although it was repurposed after its closure in 1955. Southgate Street School was the first school in the area that prioritized education for black children immediately following the Civil War. It still stands today as the home of the Newport History Museum. In the museum are some artifacts from the school, including desks and textbooks that were hand-me-downs from the white school at the time. Despite these challenges, the students and the teachers of the Southgate Street School adapted and pursued the education of black children in the community. The impact on their lives prevails today. I met Firinda through MKU as part of the community involvement element of the course, and she was also on the jury for the proposal. I had researched the history of the Southgate Street School, but would have never fully understood its significance without hearing her story myself. Her teachers were role models. They inspired the students and encouraged them to speak up, ask questions. She recalls integration midway through her schooling. The transition wasn't seamless. Just because segregation had ended, did not and does not mean that discrimination has as well. Virenda became pregnant in high school, which was subject to expulsion in the 60s. However, she wrote a petition to stay in school and continue her education, which she was granted and she was able to graduate. By the time Virenda enrolled at NKU, she already had five kids with another on the way. With several small children to care for, she pursued her degree, passed her classes, and went on to be the first African-American student to graduate from NKU's Human Services program. She has a BSW in social work and was given the Distinguished Service Award in 2004 from NKU. And four of her kids went on to graduate from NKU as well. 
The waves of color running through the design represent the ebb and flow of history running through us all. The trickles, the crashes, and the twists created through the steady current pulling us all forward. The waves on the left come together to compound and explode into a stream of liberated potential. This piece is intended to celebrate black educators and create a hopeful tone for a reform that still needs to be fought for, the true equality of education of young people today. The Southgate Street School was an important stepping stone. It was a very early example of the felt communal need for the education of African American children, some of whom's family had been directly impacted by slavery only years prior. Newport was also progressive in integration, being one of the first southern cities to integrate schools following Brown versus Board of Education. For the remaining 18 panels, I will use the motif of waves traveling through the mural while it lines the coast of the Ohio River. The murals will depict the history of Newport as part of its 225th celebration year. This 19 panel mural will highlight all of the vibrant lives that have lived and coexisted on this land in tandem with the motto, proudly celebrating our diverse past and making history every day. The panels will act as a fluid timeline connecting the past, the present, and the future. All of the lives will be treated with care and respect for those who are depicted. The mural project will span years and will be constructed as a group effort for the sake of our community. Thank you for listening and have a great day! Hi, my name is Jasmine Watson. I'm currently a BFA photo student at Northern Kentucky University, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my thesis work. As a base concept, we're all a part of a dysfunctional family. Everyone has that uncle they want to avoid at holiday gatherings. Sometimes mom and dad fight, sometimes children are the product of one night stands, and sometimes grandma's accused of killing her husband. All of these were realities that I grew up with, although my mom never let me see that. From what I knew, we were one big happy family. Three uncles, lots of cousins, and way more than enough love to go around. What I didn't know was that I was missing half of my biological family. See, my dad never really came around. I saw him about twice a year, and then he passed away when I was five. My grandma died that same year. That left my mom with a lot of new responsibility and a lot of new roles to take on. The work that I'm about to show you is largely an appreciation for her and my grandma, for everything that they have done for me and everything that they are still doing. Family resemblance has always been a pretty interesting concept to me, mostly because I don't think I look like my mom or my dad, but I definitely got my grandma's smile. I wasn't given much time in this life with her. Her passing when I was so young meant very few photos exist of us together. This is my way of making memories with her. My mama always said that the rainbows in the kitchen were grandma saying she loves us. This is a prayer card I found in an old family photo album. It's the alcoholic's prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The 12-step recovery program is on the inside. For a while, I was going back and forth on if I should flip the image to make the text more readable in the reflection or not, but I decided that deeper contemplation and thought is kind of the point of prayer. My grandma was a quilt maker. Most of the ones she made were for my mother. This was just one way you could tell who was the favorite. Can you see that little white tag in the corner of the blanket? That tag says specially made by mom. My mom and I found that as we were taking this photo. We both started crying. Just felt like another way of grandma saying she loves us. My mom and my grandmother both thought it was important for their children to know what street they lived on and to memorize the spelling. My mom jokes with me about how I thought it was hard to remember Oakwood Avenue, but she had to learn how to spell Tuscarora Way. The projects she grew up in were demolished when I was in high school. This is as close as you can get to Tuscarora now. These are my grandma's church gloves. I often wonder what she would think about me not believing in God. This is a portrait of my grandma. 
My mom's dad died when she was four years old. My grandma alone had to provide for three unruly boys and my mom. Before he had died, my grandma never had a job, never even driven a car. When she started working full time, her choice poison became Miller High Life. My mom says you never saw more than one bottle out at a time. It was just how grandma coped. This is my first tattoo, and there is a story behind this one. The figure I knew to be my grandpa was my best friend's grandfather. He passed away while we were away on spring break. This is a dried flower from his funeral. His death is what sparked the tattoo, but it is in remembrance of all the grandparents I have loved. My grandma would use these curlers when she was getting ready in the morning for work. She would dampen her hair, put in the curlers, and do her makeup while her hair dried. When I was younger, my mom would use the same curlers to curl my hair overnight. Now they are just used as a way to feel closer to my grandma. When I was five, my mom and I moved out of the cracker box we lived in on Oakwood into what I consider my childhood home. We were gifted a set of wicker rocking chairs from our previous neighbors. Our new house had a big front porch and my mom would rock me to sleep in those chairs. She can't carry me the way that she used to, but those wicker chairs remind me of the way she always will. The ring on my mom's hand has both my grandma's and my great grandma's engagement diamonds in it. This piece of jewelry is a big part of my maternal family history. The background of this photo is one of my grandma's tracksuits. This is on the corner of Hazelwood Avenue in what used to be Tuscarora Way. This sign is seemingly the only thing left of the projects that my mom was raised in. The location of this photo is one of the most important aspects of the picture. Rubby's is a bar and grill where my mom would party in her younger years and where my mom would eventually meet my dad. She tells me some nights she only made it home by the grace of God. But this place has turned into where I feel most connected with my family history and more importantly, my mama. So the long and short of it is I love my mommy. <laughs> and that's my thesis. I would like to say a few special thank yous. Um, firstly to my professors, Chris and Rachel, who even though sometimes forceful, had a ever gentle guiding hand. And to my best friend, August, who was always understanding and supporting throughout my entire college career. And all of my dear friends in advanced concepts Maddie, Cora, Sydney, Adil, Tucker, Bertie, everyone, for lending me your expertise and your opinions. And then most importantly, my wonderful mother, who without her, none of this would have been possible. So thank you. And thank you for watching. Bye. Hi, my name is Olivia Vidito, and my focus is in drawing. To me, art is an escape. The best escape for me personally has always been narrative work. I have always been intrigued how a really good story can whisk you away to a place that doesn't exist. They can take you away from the mundane. The goal of my work, no matter what the medium, it will always be to tell a good story. So I should probably say the title of my show, it is called Beltoria. And before I get into the specifics of what the narrative of Beltoria is about, just a general overall, what I do is illustration. I have been working out how to translate illustration digitally. And throughout my whole college experience, especially this year, where I've really gotten to hone in on digital art, I have been trying to find my own voice as a digital artist. But what has been consistent and what you will probably find consistent in these pieces is that they are dramatic compositions of fantastical characters, places, creatures with dramatic lighting, intense colors, strong expressions. I try to create with these pieces moments, moments in these stories, a step into the world. In this narrative, it is segments of that. That has been the difficulty, is I am a long-winded storyteller person. <laughs> I am working on ways to best translate a way that doesn't take forever 
to tell stories and I want to start out by fleshing out a universe and that's what my college experience has been about is fleshing out how to tell these stories and that's what you're going to see in the show. You're also going to see the typical subject matters I use. I say fantastical but a lot of people including myself in my first years would have condensed my subject matter into horror and I'm not arguing that. It is monsters and I'm about to explain to you why but I have learned out over the years I used to be a pretty big horror fanatic but I find that a good story isn't limited to one genre. If you would have asked me a little while ago, I would have said that my stories are maybe 50%, 75% horror. At the moment, I'm not trying to create that. There's horror included, most definitely, but I want my story to not be contained in one genre. I want to include comedy, romance, adventure, horror, all in one. and proportioned in ways appropriate and what way makes for the best story. Why horror? Why would my work be associated with horror? And that is a pretty easy explanation. It's because I draw a lot of monsters. I really like drawing monsters and it, I said fantastical. I continue to say fantastical because they're not all super scary, but a lot of times they are the traditional sort of vampire, demon, sharp-toothed, crazed villain character. I could go into a lot of reasons why I like to draw monsters, but there's a really good quote by one of my favorite directors, Guillermo del Toro. Monsters exist to be a manifestation of something that we need to understand. Not only a problem we need to overcome, but also they need to represent. Much like angels represent the beautiful, pure, eternal side of the human spirit, monsters need to represent a more tangible, more moral side of being human. Aging, decay, darkness, and so forth. The Oscar award winning director goes on, and what I take from a lot of that and what I feel in my own heart is that creating these kind of nasty ugly things are honest in a way that art should be honest. It's what I want to express most of all and it feels the most right when I do it. So that's why monsters. So Veltoria. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do my exhibition on but I had a feeling for a long time because Veltoria is the story that has gone through the most trial and error more than any other story that I've written and or started. I've gone through trial and error on a lot of stories. I didn't seriously commit to making Beltoria a real deal thing until freshman year and even then I knew I wouldn't have a solid thing by my graduating year because in the end what my idea was is to have a graphic novel and while I have some written a graphic novel in the way that I had planned to do it is a task a college student cannot do at this point. So what I wanted to achieve is tell a piece of Beltoria by doing illustrations from pivotal scenes from the first book. And what it is about, I will tell you. Beltoria is about a struggling college student named Perry Claire who finds herself suddenly isolated during the zombie apocalypse and I think we can all relate to that a little bit right now. It kind of starts out like one of those typical survival zombie stories. What to make out of a jury situation, what would you do? As predictable things go awry, all hope seems lost for Perry Claire and suddenly she's saved by a group of mysterious strangers. Just when she thinks her luck's turn around, she finds out that this group is actually a group of literal monsters. Vampires, werewolves, and a skeleton, oh my. They seem civil, but they want to take her back to their monster town, and together they claim they want to work with her to stop the zombie apocalypse. So that's Beltoria, and I called it Beltoria because um, Beltoria is the name of that monster town that they go to. It's three books. I've written in novel form the first two books. My plan was to have a printed version, no illustrations of the book there. Each illustration is one from a chapter. There's 11 chapters, so I did 11 illustrations of a pivotal scene. I titled them not the chapter titles, but a line from that scene that gives a little bit more context. So something else that is pretty typical to mention is process. This has been a very experimental specifically for this. I have a very bear attack sort of style. These paintings kind of took form as rough sketches going into 
more fleshed out ideas, that I learned better ways to get references, as well as learned better programs. So, I am happy to announce that I am planning to launch Beltoria as a, an ongoing webcomic series later in May. It'll probably be early access on Patreon and then released to other web platforms. If you want to keep track of that and see where Beltoria is going and any other projects that I'm working on, the first place that usually gets updates is my Instagram, which I'll have right here at ov underscore arts. In my Instagram there's a bio link with my website, my Patreon, and my portfolio if you are interested in seeing that. Finally, I'd like to go through some thank yous. First of all, I'd like to thank my parents. I could not ask for a better support system. They have supported me every step of the way and it's been amazing and means so much. I would also like to thank the rest of my family and friends for their support as well. When you get confirmation from others that you can do something like this, it means so much. I also want to thank my Austin professors, Christina, Mark, Kevin, Steven, Kim, Nick. All of you guys challenged me in such awesome ways and formed me into such a better artist. And I can't thank you enough for that. That does it for my artist talk. I know a lot of you guys in person that are watching this, so I want you to know that I miss you. And I want to thank you for watching this, this being my first attempt at a recording, so we'll see how that goes. See you soon, hopefully.